All right, so let's move on to our next uh, speaker. Uh, Dennis uh, Zaitsev will talk to us about the 30 meter telescope, the new generation of ground based observatories. Go ahead, Dennis. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, for such a nice event. Uh, my name is Dennis Zaitsev. Uh, I am located in Pasadena, California, and I work on our TMT project. TMT is 30 meter telescope, and it's a topic for my presentation today. So we're going to talk about the new generation ground based observatory. And our example of this kind of observatories is going to be the TMT project. So, <clears throat> uh, before I just go, I, I want to introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, I used to live in Canada, and that's, that's how I appeared to be a RASC uh, member. Uh, then I relocated to Pasadena, California for a job to work on TMT. That's why I talked to you from the Pacific Coast. Okay, let's go ahead. So just a bunch of uh, quick facts about the project so you'll have some context and uh, some generic information about the TMT. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, the project started in 2004. You might think it's pretty old project, but uh, for this uh, scale, it's actually pretty young. And uh, uh, if you think about it, uh, for instance, uh, JWST uh, took more than 20 years to build and launch. So it's international project. This is something uh, interesting about TMT. TMT is a result of collaboration of uh, several countries, including Canada, United States, uh, United States is represented as for now by two universities, Caltech and UCLA, Japan, India, and China. <clears throat> uh, speaking about their optical design, our TMT is going to be uh, Richie Christian. Uh, so if you have, like me, uh, one of these designs, uh, you should know that you have telescope which look exactly the same as sir, the biggest telescopes in the world. Um, TMT stands for 30 meter telescope. So it's uh, for real 30 meter diameter primary mirror. We're going to talk in more in details about this mirror on next slides. Uh, also, let me point, uh, TMT has the secondary mirror at the top. and Third mirror, uh, tertiary mirror, which is uh, 2.5 by 3.5 meters. It's uh, totally flat. Um, and uh, we're going to see the optical path a little bit later. Don't be confused. So you're going to see how it all goes. It's, I know it's hard to understand uh, how it's going to work and how light is going to be collected. And where is the camera? Uh, we're going to see it. Our next slides. Uh, talking about F ratio, it's F15, final focal ratio. Uh, so it's pretty slow optic, and you might imagine high magnification, and there you want to see far away, that's why. Uh, talking about their band of wavelength, TMT will be sensitive to. It's uh, starting from ultraviolet to near infrared. So basically, everything we see, visual band, a uh, little bit UV and near infrared. Also, if you think about resolution of their TMT, it's uh, two times of Hubble Space Telescope. And this is where you start thinking and their uh, why and their aperture is everything, of course. So um, the resolution proportional to the uh, diameter of aperture. And uh, here we go. Um, talking about the status of the project, so I want to mention that construction on the site haven't started yet. 
but many major and critical systems are ready for construction or already started being built or in active prototyping. So the process is going. Um, we plan three first light instruments or that would be Iris, W4s and Modis. I'm not gonna uh, uh, tell you what they mean because it, it, it's, it's very long. Just you need to understand that TMT instruments will be spectrographs and their most science value comes from spectrography. And their iris is infrared imaging spectrograph, for instance, that's what it stands for, double forces wild field optic spectrograph and what is this multi-objective high definition or uh, imaging, uh, high, de high definition infrared spectrograph. Um, so when it's gonna be alive, our our expectations that first light is going to be somewhere in, in 2030s, and uh, we are very positive about it. And uh, when we build it and commission this uh, observatory, it's going to be biggest ground-based observatory in Northern Hemisphere, and probably in the world for some time. Depends if extremely European extremely large telescope is being built or not by the time TMT is commissioned. The European Extremely Large Telescope is being built in Southern Hemisphere, north of Chile. So we're going to compete for their world biggest one, and then we're going to hold the world biggest one in Northern Hemisphere for sure. Okay, so that's quick facts. Let's move forward and let's talk a little bit about construction side. So for this uh, scale of observatories, uh, it's very important to build observatory in a place uh, on on our Earth where atmosphere is very stable, uh, dry, and cold. And there are not too many places, to be honest, around Earth like that. Our TMT are performed very comprehensive research. I think it took five years to go around the world, and there. Uh, TMT team picked two or spots, the best ones. And uh, we see here on the screen Mauna Kea, Hawaii, uh, at elevation more than four kilometers. Or this is our preferred site. And uh, on this picture on the top right, we see La Palma, Canary Island, or with on elevation are uh, two kilometers and 250 meters about that. They are basically the same in terms of characteristics. They have uh, differences and uh, they have different conditions, but they both are really good to build this kind of observatory. And you can tell this just by looking at the picture here at La Palma and Mauna Kea Summit, how many observatories already built there. This is what we have right now. So that points that is probably a good place. Okay. However, I wanted to mention that decision, final decision about the site for their TMT observatory is not made yet. And hopefully it's gonna be made soon. Let's move to the next one. So on this earth slide, I wanna present you the results of Astra 2020 decadal survey published by um, National Academies of Earth Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, it's a very big event because it's basically a roadmap uh, with priorities and vision for their next 10 years in astronomy and astrophysics. So I'm very proud and are happy to announce that TMT was identified in this survey as the highest ground-based priority for the next decade as a member of US LTP program. US LTP program, you can see on the right this uh, uh, picture, uh, it's a joint effort of TMT and another extremely large telescope, GMT, Giant Magellan Telescope, which is gonna be built in Chile. And uh, if you build both, then we're gonna have extremely large telescope GMT in South 
southern hemisphere an extremely large telescope in northern hemisphere, which is much better for science. And there, as part of this survey, uh, it was recommended for National Science Foundation to fund the TMT project, which is really a good milestone for TMT project. If we get funds from National Science Foundation, their TMT won't need any funds up until the end of construction. So it's very, very good for us. <clears throat> okay, let's move forward to the mirror. So uh, ELT stands for Extremely Large Telescope. And uh, the size of the mirror is 30 meters. Here, to, to compare and give you some sense of the size, we see their basketball court. And here, there is a little guy. This is the size of the person to scale. So you see it's pretty big uh, structure. And there, uh, you, you might think how we're gonna build it. Of course, it's impossible to build in one piece that big mirror. So it all started with Keck telescope. And our Keck telescope is a 10 meter telescope with a segmented mirror. And there, it's already proven technology and the most importantly, it's scalable technology to build segmented mirrors. So if you build 10 meter segmented mirror, you can build three times more using the same technology. Uh, in case of TMT, uh, we have 492 segments. That's segments our primary mirror consists of. And if you count also spare segments, it's going to be 574. Uh, 82 different types of mirrors. Uh, the size of one hexagon or piece is 1.44 across corners. Uh, 45 millimeter thick glass ceramic. And we're going to have 2.5 millimeter gaps between segments, which is going to be about 0.6% loss of light. So yeah, it's it's a big thing, and there, again, we we reusing the technology used in CAC, but that doesn't mean it doesn't mean it's very easy, because the size matters. There, the bigger size gets, the more complex systems to support this size observatory. So let's move forward, and here I want to show you their uh, rendering or simulation. Uh, of light path. I'll be, I'll try to comment as it goes. So here we see the light coming uh, of, uh, through the opening directly from Zenith, collected to the second mirror, secondary mirror, uh, then bounce it to the uh, M3, and M3 delivers their prime focus to different instruments so see it's moving delivering to some of the first generation instruments and uh, i believe this video also contains second generation instruments so again to recap the tmt is pointed right now directly to the zenith, zenith and their their light goes that way gets reflected and collected by the main mirror m2 goes to m uh, sorry m1 uh, sorry for confusion so light collect, gets collect uh, gets collected uh, by m1 the main mirror and there comes to m2 and then m2 sends light to m3 here in the middle and m3 points it to their instruments uh, it's a little bit different from the classical richie Christian because our telescopes they have opening in the main mirror and they're uh, just light goes to the visual back or to a camera but here we don't do this we just point it to their instrument but it, it, but in terms of optical design and the same thing all right let's move to the enclosure so canada participating in tmt as a partner and their one of their contributions or from canada is enclosure design and production uh, the enclosure uh, 
are is designed by Empire Dynamic Structures from BC Canada, uh, managed by Canadian National Research Council. Uh, the enclosure itself have a unique collot design. Uh, this is not something you're going to see in other observatories. It's very unique, and I believe uh, uh, it's a very good fit for their TMT in terms of uh, characteristics uh, required for that size of telescope. Uh, speaking about size, the dome itself is going to be 180 feet high. Uh, so you can imagine 10-story building or apartment building, and there, this is uh, the size. Uh, their enclosure design passed production readiness reviews in 2020, and it's ready for production. Uh, so we're going to start manufacturing pieces very soon, and they will be waiting for their to be delivered on site for assembly. <clears throat> Uh, here we see their enclosure exploded view. You can see that basically uh, three pieces, the base with their rotation axis here. Another piece is their cup uh, with the rotation axis that way. And also we have shutter here. Um, it's very specific design, I understand. It's not easy to uh, uh, to picture yourself how it's working. So on next slide, we're gonna actually see it in action. Uh, you see the shutter opens. We see their base is moving, and there we see the cup is rotating. And here we go. We see their mirror, and their target acquisition is done. Uh, also on picture, you can see these vents. These vents are especially designed to uh, guarantee their perfect ventilation for the observatory. All right, let's move to the next one. Another contributions from Canada, I think the most important maybe component for instruments to do science is their uh, narrow field infrared adaptive optics system or for short nefarious don't uh, think about dr nefarious from our uh, spectral me uh, it's our uh, nefarious with as a dent uh, so it's designed in a collaboration with nrc uh, national research council Herzberg astronomy and astrophysics and their victoria bc um Adaptive optics for the first light, infrared instru instruments, iris and modis. Uh, adaptive optics, what it makes are uh, very valuable and very capable in terms of science. Uh, TMT without adaptive optics would be just a telescope, big telescope. But with adaptive optics, it's going to be a very powerful telescope. I'm going to explain it in the next slides why. Uh, or on, on this slide as well. Uh, it, adaptive optics main mission is to correct aberrations introduced by the atmospheric turbulence in real time. You might you probably know that our mother Earth protects us from radiation pretty well, and there, we we can observe their light coming to us only through two windows basically. One window is a visual band and the other window with a radio band. Fortunately, we also have a little bit of infrared coming through the atmosphere. So this is where TMT shines. <clears throat> and there, another thing is turbulence. Or they're looking through the atmosphere from Earth is basically like looking from the bottom of the swimming pool to the sky. So it's all blurry. Uh, adaptive optics. It's your prescription and your glasses to not see it, stop seeing it blurry and start seeing it sharp. Uh, adaptive optics operates at up to 800 hertz. And uh, it relays the corrected light from telescope to science instruments. So science instruments, they receive corrected uh, uh, light. So let me introduce 
very uh, simplified schema how it all works. So we can see that light is coming from the telescope to the mirror, then it gets reflected, and at the beam splitter, it split it in two beams. One goes to wave front. Wave front senses their these are atmospheric uh, uh, aberrations introduced by atmospheric turbulence, and control systems control system uh, makes decision how to correct it, and uh, deforms the mirror. After that, we have corrected wave front coming through their optical optical train to the imaging sensors. So. You might ask how we see their changes and their, how we understand what to correct. So adaptive optics uses laser guide star facility to do that. Uh, laser guide star facility or LGSF or for short generates a pattern of guiding stars in the sky. It's basically artificial asterism and their you can see it in the meso mesospheric sodium layer. Uh, so adaptive optic system, optic system uh, senses changes in this pattern and uh, analyzes it and corrects them with deformable mirror. So that's how we do it. Uh, so let's see some adaptive optics in action. Here we see their Mars imaged in I band. And uh, we see on that side the simplified schema of adaptive optics. Uh, aberrated wavefront coming to their mirror. And with flat mirror, you can see it's all blurry. However, with deformable mirror, you see corrected wavefront. It's like person first time trying glasses, basically. I can tell you because that's why I experienced when I was a kid after I first time put on my glasses. Okay, let's move to another example in action. So the second example again is from the real life and the, this example is from the CAC observatory uh, where we can, we, can, we can use adaptive optics. So on the left, we see Neptune without adaptive optics. You can see this, uh, glow and blob and it's very very hard to understand anything we see some features but not a lot so on the right we have the same picture but with adaptive optics in action so the main idea uh, behind building their new instruments for science new observatories is to open new um, new window in the universe and their tmt with its capabilities and resolution plus adaptive optics actually does that, uh, opening new window and to see universe in a different way nobody else uh, would be able to see before. Um, we have some simulations, or I'm, I'm gonna show on next slide the simulations. This is how it's gonna look like. Uh, the simulations are done by our colleagues from UCLA. So. Uh, Neptune again, uh, seen limited, not not too much to see in the telescope, and I would say you'll be lucky if you see Neptune like that on telescope, uh, with just regular telescope. With CAC, we can see much more. Uh, however, uh, if we look at their TMT compared to CAC, and their, this is simulation, of course, we don't have TMT right now, but we can simulate it using software. And uh, we can see TMT compared to Voyager 2. This is the actual picture from Voyager 2. And this is simulation for TMT, how it's gonna look like. And uh, that brings us to conclusion that with this uh, size of telescope and their instrumentation uh, powered by adaptive optics, we, we, don't need, we don't necessarily need their space missions to explore the solar system. <clears throat> okay, let's go to, I have another simulation. Uh, this time is a simulation of Io. Uh, 
So on the left, again, it's done by the, our colleagues at UCLA, the simulation of our TMT in the middle, TMT using Iris or uh, instrument in H-band compared to CAC with adaptive optics and compared to Galileo spacecraft. So you can see how much features TMT will allow us to see in our solar system. And this is just blows mind of everybody. <laughs> That's why people are waiting for this scale of observatories. Uh, uh, new observations are gonna give more data to prove theories and to ask new questions and apply uh, this data to existing models. So everybody's waiting and we're gonna have it very soon. Uh, this is not the last one. I have something to show about deep space. Uh, so this is simulation done by UCLA team uh, of M31, our center of the galaxy. And on the left, so both squares are approximately, I would say six arc seconds, field of view, wide. Uh, we see Hubble Space Telescope image, and we see simulation how it's gonna look like exactly the same object with the same uh, field of view through the TMT iris instrument. Uh, you can actually research and measure stars in the center of the galaxy now. So yes, that's another uh, amazing example of capabilities of TMT observatory in the future. And there, that's pretty much it. Uh, at the very end, I wanted to show you there again, rendering uh, of our TMT. Uh, let's just look at it and uh, enjoy. Imagine that we are already there and TMT is already built. Here we go, our main mirror. see a treasury mirror. And we can see acquiring target and process. And we're gonna see adaptive optics in action. This is our LGSF, laser guide star facility. So yeah, that's the TMT project. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask and QA right now. And also there is tons of information on this website, tmt.org. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, that is absolutely amazing. And I'm so glad I reached out to you and you just happened to be working on this project. Uh, so thanks again for bringing, this, uh, bringing us up to speed. Um, Emma, do we have questions for Dennis? Um, we do. First question comes in from Ralph. Are the gaps between segments to allow for thermal expansion? Oh, uh, well, uh, I have to say that I'm not an expert in their optics, uh, but as far as I know, uh, all these are um, factors taken in account. So they're TMT main mirror, all these 492 segments are going to be controlled in real time uh, by the computer system. And it will be measured in real time and corrected in real time. And their mirror is gonna be reacted into all our factors like changing temperature, uh, stuff like that, yeah. Great. Um... Warren wants to know, are there plans to add any other stations off of M3? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, of course. Um, Warren wants to know, are there plans to add any other stations off of M3? 
stations of M3. Um, um, I assume the question is about instruments. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we plan to uh, build the TMT and their have first light with three instruments. After that, we have plans to add next generation, I believe three more instruments. So it's going to be extended over time. And our, the TMT is built in that way to be extendable. So I hope it answers the question. Uh, great. Harold, so this is not um, a question, but it's a comment. Harold says, that's an amazing system. Thank you. Um, next question comes from Warren. How much deflection over the total, how much deflection is there over the total diameter in each mirror? Uh, each, uh, each mirror is 1.44 meter. So I, I'm not sure about deflection. I can direct this uh, question to our optics team. Again, I'm software engineer and uh, I can answer more about software. Well, uh, you see telescope at my background. I can answer other questions, but I can follow up on that. Great. Um, Ron wants to know, Webb will need three months to get all of its 18 mirror segments wrenched properly aligned. Would the land-based TMT process need more or less time than that? Um, I don't know, to be honest, because here we are come into the world of assembly and integration. And uh, this is something going to happen only at the very, very final stages of TMT construction. I believe our process, even having though much bigger number of segments uh, than we have right now in other telescopes, our process of aligning will be faster and easier it's a ground-based observatory. We can always come and uh, you know, fix something, or we can patch software, and our aligning uh, process will be powered in great extent by software as well. So yeah, I expect it's not going to take a long time. Cool. Um, next question comes in from Brian. How will the James Webb Space Telescope resolution and capabilities compare to the 30-meter telescope? Um, well, James Webb Telescope is, uh, of course, smaller, but let's don't forget that James Webb Telescope is in the space. Uh, so uh, we, are, we have two different situations, and they're, they going to complement each other. I think I'm going to answer it like that. You can calculate the resolution of uh, uh, the difference in resolution just by uh, ratio of the diameters G, JWST to the TMT. That's what you're going to get, how bigger or smaller the uh, resolution would be. But they're not going to compete. They're going to complement each other. The TMT is going to follow up on finds done by JWST. Great. Um, this next question comes in from Paul. You mentioned you're a software engineer. What software do you work on? Oh, thank you for this question. So um, TMT, you might imagine, is a system of systems. And there, there are lots of independent uh, components, uh, hardware components are working simultaneously and are at the same time. So to orchestrate and uh, control all these independent components, you need software. And that software is called observatory software. It's uh, basically brains for their observatory. And uh, this kind of software we are working on. That includes uh, development kit for their other teams who are developing instruments and different subsystems. And also this development kit includes 
uh, special instrumentation to integrate with each other. Plus, uh, our observatory software provides uh, observatory control system. Uh, and as part of it is a sequencing. Every observation is basically a sequence of actions. Do this, that, or say, acquire target, uh, focus to target, uh, start exposure, end exposure, uh, change filter, start another exposure, these kind of things. This is sequencing. So software I'm working on is uh, one of these uh, components also. Plus, I wanted to mention the acquiring their science data, it's not end of the story. After you get exposure, after you get science frame, as we name it, uh, you need to pass it through data reduction system. You need to pass it through different systems to collect metadata and attach it to their science exposure so scientists will understand uh, the conditions this exposure was done and they will have metadata associated with the science frame required for their calculations and their analysis and etc. So this kind of software is also developed by the team or I'm working in. That's very cool. Um, Betty wants to know how much computational power will the adaptive optics system require? Oh, uh, well, it requires very powerful computational array. Uh, we use their computational our system based on GPU. So it's uh, almost like uh, machine learning uh, hardware, the same probably technologies. So yeah, it's, it's very powerful. Great. Um, that's it for the questions for tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for questions. Thanks again, Dennis. Uh, great presentation. And thanks to our other presenters, uh, Chris and John and Dennis Gray. Mm -hmm.